So we live in this fantastic city. Uh, of course, uh, in many ways, maybe not uh, unlike uh, your lovely city. Uh, it's been it's a city that grows has been growing very fast over the last uh, 50 to 70 years. Uh, but here we are in the let's say most beautiful part of the older uh, part of the city. Uh, and Istanbul is, of course, as you might know, divided by this uh, fantastic strait, the, Bos the Bosporus. Um, and it creates, let's say, among other things, these very quaint moments. But Istanbul is, of course, also, uh, uh, as Brazil, uh, and, or Turkey, uh, is also part of the emerging econ economies, and, of course, also generates the, the more growing, uh, large-scale uh, projects, as we know them. But daily life uh, most of the time happens in this uh, sort of setting, which is uh, what we call the post-informal city, uh, post Gecekondo neighborhoods. There, there are four to five or six story tall uh, apartment buildings that are quite densely packed together. Uh, and this is basically where we landed in 2006 to start our office. Yeah. So firstly, we run you through a couple of uh, projects here. We are architects, so we do what architects do. We do interiors, we do exhibitions. Uh, we do research in materials here for a concrete research project uh, with 14 other partners. Uh, we do exhibition designs here for the last Istanbul Design Biennial uh, last year, uh, working in this case with Portuguese cork, of all things. Uh, and we are, of, of course, also, let's say, in some ways, part of the, uh, the liberal economy uh, and the projects that comes with it. Luckily, this didn't get built. Uh, but it's, a, let's say, an image of the, of the projects that are happening in the city. Uh, a project, though, that we would have liked to build uh, was for a, a public competition uh, here in a typical neighborhood as self described as the post-informal uh, uh, city. So a self-built build, self -built and unplanned city. Uh, the site was this uh, red triangle uh, to build a new public school. Uh, this was the existing school. It was to be torn down. Uh, and this site, as you see here, 20 meter drop, so a, a steep uh, section of the city to, to be home to a new school. So this was the site in the 50s. This is how it looks today. And as you see, the typical way of building in Istanbul, carve big steps into the, the hills and put blocks on top. We thought, okay, uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to build a landscape school. I'm from a, a country where a half a meter uh, elevation change on a site is a miracle. Here we had 20 meters. Uh, so why not use those 20 meters to, uh, ex let's say, build a, a school, but also a park. I think as Charles uh, described earlier, that could become a neighborhood park uh, when school hours were over. Uh, so this was our naive proposal and uh, the jury comment we got was, we know this is the future, but we are not there yet. Uh, and we are, let's say, continuing to, to dream about the future. Uh, another school project I will share uh, with you here just tonight is an adapted reuse project of a factory, uh, how to turn this uh, former bag factory into an uh, amazing uh, school community for a new established university. I think one thing we learned in uh, doing so many exhibition projects in, in, uh, in respect to public space is that actually exhibitions are of course um, also public space, even though they are in interior projects. They usually, um, they, they have the desire to attract public or audience. So that uh, we usually realize that the, in some ways the more unfinished you leave a space, uh, potentially you have more people coming into it feeling comfortable to be there. So that has sort of been a guiding line for us in terms of interiors. Um, this uh, project will hopefully start um, education in this building by September this year. And uh, it's quite actively keeping us busy uh, these, these day days. But what was important for us, I think, from the beginning, uh, because partially um, we were new to the city. I mean, I am from Istanbul, but I didn't uh, practice as an architect in Istanbul until we came to Istanbul to start our own office. And uh, Gregors, of course, didn't know the city. So when we came in 2006, part of our challenge was to learn the city. Uh, as architects, as professionals, like, how do you navigate in this city? And uh, in 2006, it is kind of historic, prehistoric times right now when you look back at it, because the smartphones were not available yet, so the GPS wasn't in our pocket, and it was actually an issue to, uh, to, to navigate if you didn't know the city. We bought these two books and got horribly lost uh, because it, the scale was just not working. 
and it became sort of a joke for us to 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 try want to do maps um, and we started with uh, Gregors wanted to do the bus map but we thought it was would be more fun to do the minibus map so minibus is we, it will keep coming back in our presentation uh, is a certain mode of transportation that city has invented in the 70s uh, which is basically these are individually owned uh, minibuses that drive on uh, certain routes but the routes can change and you can kind of stop them anywhere you want and then get on them and pay for the course that you're driving and it can kind of stop anywhere you want it to stop. Uh, um, but maybe it was not such a big joke because to make the map we actually had to take all the buses, right? So uh, it took a week to, to sit. Uh, One month. A month. No, yes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and drive from all these, which is only five nodes of the most inner parts of the city. So it's not even the complete network. Uh, but yeah, as Selva says, it's... Uh, it was produced as a, a souvenir um, and sold in a souvenir shop in a kind of shopping mall. Uh, the ide idea was again sort of an art project, but it took on a, a lot of uh, a beginning for a lot of other mapping projects that we have done. Uh, one of which was commissioned by an art institution, Garanti Galeri, to look at Istanbul uh, with through maps, uh, called into, uh, compiled into a book called Mapping Istanbul, in which we looked at on a global scale what. Uh, you know, how big the city Istanbul was and um, sort of what are the flights that come out of Istanbul, which are the countries that don't requi require visa. So luckily this map has been updated since that. In fact, no, now you can fly directly uh, between <laughs> uh, Brazil and Turkey. Uh, and here are the bus lines out of Istanbul and to, to figure out how well Istanbul is connected to the, to the remaining of the country. So there were about 70 maps uh, and 30 diagrams that looked at uh, the context of Istanbul. Yeah, including the age. So. Here you see how the city grew. The darker it is, the older it is. Uh, and most of the light green is actually built after uh, 1950s. Maybe just to mention here that Istanbul is a large city, right? It's 100 kilometers uh, spanning through east-west. Uh, with 15 million plus or minus two million uh, residents. Maybe not so un unexpected, but uh, the demographics uh, meaning, or uh, where people tend to live uh, is along the water, and all, maybe not so unexpected, the people that are, are more privileged uh, then tend to use, uh, to live at the, at the edge. Um, this is all the bus lines. Et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of, let's say, background materials that we developed through this project. So partially this was for us a, a site research, Sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we, we just really wanted to get to know the context uh, that we were in. So it was for our purpose and luckily it was uh, paid by an art institution. Same uh, art institution. Uh, maybe I should just mention that at, at the moment we did this work, there was no institutions that were uh, solely dedicated to architecture. So the art institution stepped in in a way to, to support uh, design and architecture. Uh, the mapping project was part of a larger framework called, called Becoming Istanbul. Uh, and when this exhibition uh, eventually came to Istanbul, we were also asked to, to do the exhibition design for it here. So we will just, I think, flip through these images yeah. just to so this, uh, sh share just them to with you. One thing, if you're interested in Istanbul, this database uh, yeah on Istanbul is still available on becomingistanbul.org. There was a, a speaker's corner, there was a gaming space for talking about urban issues. Uh, we tried to make it as playful as possible in this otherwise uh, quite formal setting. One of the mapping projects that uh, we did in the, big, in the earlier um, time of our practice was also this uh, project in Diyarbakir. Uh, Diyarbakir is in the east of East, in Turkey, which is a uh, kind of the Kurdish capital. And in the 90s, due to forced evictions from uh, villages because of uh, the, let's say, the, the ongoing conflict, um, a lot of women had to migrate to the cities and uh, there were a lot of suicides among women. So uh, a lot of NGOs tried to help, but they started offices, but there was sort of this culture barrier. People didn't know how to walk into the office. There was a big threshold. And then one, one NGO got smart, and they started uh, these laundry uh, services. It was just this very humble building uh, that provided free laundry service, uh, which then gave a basically console in the back. So it was sort of a Trojan horse. Uh, you came to do laundry, but then you could access all kinds of other console and help. Um, so this, uh, 
practices like these, and at, at the time when we were doing the map, there were about six of these laundry mats, uh, because now the municipality was also supporting the project. Uh, and there were an abundance, uh, let's say, of NGOs that were helping women. Um, so in, in, a, in a way, though it starts from a sad story, the Arbor had become a very progressive city in terms of uh, gender issues. And we did a map uh, for it for the biennial in Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. So of course there's a kind of a little bit of a, a weird uh, combination when you are taking a very real life problem and putting in in front of a, a sort of a normal audience in, in, in an architecture show in, in Rotterdam. So, um, so for us this became sort of this one of the strange dilemmas of our practice as architects to, okay, we, we like to document things uh, and we are interested in documentation, but obviously the audience that benefits it is different than the audience that should benefit it in some ways. So um, it's kind of an ongoing conversation with ourselves that we would like to share it with you. So in our, let's say, I think we're coming to the end of the mappings. Yeah, but to maybe to contract for that, uh, we also started doing these maps um, in a very uh, cheap magazine, uh, kind of a cartoon magazine. Every month we had a corner um, and where we were basically submitting a map instead of a cartoon uh, for a kind of five lira, which is similar to Brazilian money, basically, um, magazine. And uh, these were meant to be cut, cut and put in your pocket. So this showed uh, the biggest parks in the city and which kind of buses take you there. Or here trying to deal with the urban myth that Istanbul is not bikeable because it's too hilly. Uh, but if really, if you do a kind of a thorough data or analysis of the, of the topography of the city overlaid with the map, these are the remaining streets that you can actually comfortably bike on. So um, yes, Istanbul is probably at the moment dangerous to bike in, but if we put some effort into it, we could probably uh, find ways to do it. Um, but to, uh, we will show one more movie now. Uh, only last year we were asked to submit uh, Mapping Istanbul to an exhibition about Istanbul uh, in uh, Maxi in Rome. Uh, and we realized when we were doing the book in 2009, 2007 to 2009, it was actually quite a comfortable moment. It was, it's, it's unique actually in some ways, that it was, there were no wars in the area, um, or not, not, not like it is today, um, and the financial crisis hadn't really happened in 2008, so everyone, uh, probably also including Brazil, was imagining a kind of quite smooth future. Uh, it was a very optimistic moment, so when you look at the book, it, it doesn't really have anything political. It really thinks it can just document uh, what is existing in a kind of comfortable way. Um, one of the key questions that is for us, I think, if we can go back one slide, uh, that has also happened since 2006-07, uh, uh, was the protests about Gezi Park. Uh, you might have heard about it in a uh, couple of two years ago, or three years ago now. Uh, this park, which is one of the largest parks in the city center, was to be turned into a shopping mall, and there was huge resistance. And it's the first resistance in maybe 30 years. Uh, and it's the first time kind of an urban urban issue becomes uh, important for just the general public. So very important also in our, I think, psychology. But we will show a short video. Um, why also, what was the background of the Gezi Park? So of course, there is no, nothing wrong with big infrastructure projects um, in some ways. Uh, but the lack of participation um, in, as, as the public felt, I think, as us also being a part of that just a normal citizen, um, was so immense uh, at that time. So I think it, it was all of these projects that were happening very fast, and you were hearing about them always at the last minute as they were being launched, uh, that led to, I think, a kind of an energy that was building up towards the Gezi Park protest. So we, we will talk about this. Um, so this is the context of the project that we want to show now. Uh, which it was when Audi asked us to think about the future of mobility in Istanbul. So this is in 2012, uh, exactly one year before the protests um, in 2013. Yeah, so again, in this very optimistic moment where uh, it was very exciting to look at different cities and how they compare uh, and what we can learn from each of them. So Audi being the technology-driven uh, te technology firm was of course interested in mobility, traffic, future, technology, and as I was mentioned at that time, uh, and still, and still, but the community building, participation, and democracy was a kind of very important issues 
for everyday citizens uh, still to be raised. So we had kind of a lofty thesis. We said the future of democracy is in the streets uh, where cars have freed up space for park. Park being an online platform that we were um, kind of proposing. Proposing to Audi. Uh. And the idea of it was very simple. Uh, so if you used shared mo modes of mobility, you would gain points and these points would be collected on a kind of mobile platform. And with those points, you would be able to occupy uh, parts in your neighborhood or your streets and throw parties. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so, so that, that, that was sort of the idea, like th that you could actually occupy or rent space in your neighborhood uh, if, if you participated with the shared mobility. But how, do we got, how did we get there? I mean, of course, Eastern Poland, I think, still rank in TomTom's uh, uh, surveys as one of the most congested cities in the world. Uh, so, yes, there is, there is problems in the main infrastructure uh, of the city when we talk about car-driven uh, uh, traffic. But actually, the, we think, on top of that, let's say the neighborhood uh, mobil mobility is even worse, right? I mean, th there is nothing staged about this uh, little video, except that the guy is not work walking on the street with the risk of being run down, uh, but insisting on trying to use the sidewalk. And yes, it does <laughs> snow in Istanbul now and then. <laughs> the baby survived. He wasn't hurt. <laughs> he is going to kindergarten now. <laughs> so what is the future of mobility in Istanbul? And we partly think it is in the past as well as in the future. But uh, as, we, as we talked about earlier about the, the shared mobility that today looks like this or that, uh, probably not the most environmental friendly or the safest or the most qualified drivers, but it's a system that works in a city where the public transport cannot or has not caught up yet with the size of the city. Uh, and there are many, of course, uh, new models of car sharing as well, especially in Europe now. You see every city is adopting a, a kind of car share system, uh, starting from Zipcar onwards. Uh, and for example, Zipcar in New York kind of claims that every shared car takes away 20 cars from traffic. So if you imagine Istanbul with 20 times less traffic, it would be kind of heaven. Wow. <laughs> so uh, why does it make sense uh, even further is that uh, Let's say Istanbul has a, a quite a varied uh, mix of transport uh, uh, options. Uh, the interesting part is that large part of it is privately owned, right? Uh, one individual participate in the public transport system, uh, either by owning a car, a bus, or a boat. Uh, so in today's terms, that will be called, or in our minds, uh, crowdsourcing an entire bus fleet. Um, but why are the streets important uh, in Istanbul? Uh, it's partly because it is the public space of the city. It is where people demonstrate, take a break, uh, on a, you know, are with their friends, uh, on holiday even. So the streets, more than parks, are actually the true public space of the city. And then streets, of course, are important uh, for the social, cho social cohesion of a place as well. And uh, we wanted to talk about Jane Jacobs and the kind of discourse she started in the 1970s about democratic streets, where actually appropriating streets, having a right to streets, to, to having, uh, having the chance to change the streets was as very important. So not to think about streets as neutral places, but places that could be sort of owned by the neighborhood, which is actually in, in some ways the case in, in Istanbul still, but the general tendency is actually to get rid of that uh, ownership and to, to neutralize the streets. Um, so we, we were plan kind of proposing a system where you, with the points you could you collect, you could either rent space on your neighborhood or in a kind of public square uh, for protests, activities, concerts, whatever. And here you see a kind of, we did these movies which showed uh, our vision of what the future could be. So you see Meta Amja coming out, which uh, for the plot that was reserved for him to start up his backgammon game with his friends. And of course, at the heart of the idea we had developed was Taksim uh, Square and Taksim Park, uh, the Gizi Park, because it was uh, the space that we felt sort of the most vulnerable issue at that point was the Taksim Square and the Gezi Park because it, it just really wasn't at, um, um, as a public discussion. All the architects and the urbanists and so forth were talking about it, but it, it hadn't really caught up uh, with the rest of the city. 
So we're almost getting to show you, let's say, a, a demo of how that worked. But before that, I uh, <laughs> wanted to make sure that it's understood that Istanbul actually is very quick in adopting new technologies, not that we are uh, the um, proponent of uh, Facebook, but Istanbul is the second largest Facebook city in the world, partly due to the young, uh, very young population. And also, why is software important? Uh, because at that time when we did the exhibition, and also still now, Turkey is trying to rewrite its con constitution. Uh, this is up for the seventh time now. Every 20 years we are rewriting the constitution, so the software of the country. So, uh, and also, actually, we are rebuilding the city. Uh, so could we now think of all those two things together? Um, so that was all the background of the project, and we will show you now a short animation um, that talked about how this um, software could run. Park is an online platform for social interaction and mobility. It works like this. You gain points every time you choose to travel by intelligent domosh. With the points you collect, you get to rent space and organize events. Now let's take a look at how Elif is using Park. Elif wakes up and starts planning her day on Park. Elif looks at the many things happening in Beyoğlu today. She likes to live in Beyoğlu because there are many neighborhood events along with interesting institutional programs. Here is an invitation posted by Leila and Mehmet. Seems like their son Malik has learned how to ride a bike. Elif loves little Malik and would be happy to celebrate his achievement this evening. The event needs one more supporter for it to happen. She gladly accepts. The celebration will be on their street tonight. What else is happening in her neighborhood? Elif wants to run tomorrow morning at Gessy Park. So she goes to her neighborhood groups and rides to the morning runners. Seems like Lucas is up for a morning run. Elif also likes to cook in the communal kitchen. She will throw a feast next Friday. Many different communities organize events on park. Elif is an architect and checks today's professional events in her city. Is there something that fits her schedule? These are all the architectural events located on the map. She can see when and where each event takes place. This urbanism workshop looks interesting. Let's see how it can be incorporated in her route today. Here's a list of all her appointments. She can easily go to the workshop before her doctor's appointment. Park places all her scheduled events on the map and suggests an efficient mode of transportation to get from place to place. The planner suggests the most efficient routes, taking into consideration the weather, traffic, and events on the streets. One of her colleagues, Hande, is also going to the same event. Great, Elif and Hande can share a dolmush and earn points. Elif usually prefers to take the mode of transportation that gets her the most points, even if it means walking a little. On her profile, Elif shares all the pictures taken at the events she has hosted. She can also keep track of how she is gaining and sharing her points. By mostly taking shared transportation, Elif has collected a lot of points and helped organize many community events. She especially likes engaging youngsters to help them learn fun things and make sure everybody cleans up after. She has gotten such good feedback that she is now on the run to becoming a neighborhood leader. Support Elif by attending one of her Robots for Kids workshops. And remember, with Park, you too can make a difference in your community.
right. So, um, I mean, some of these things, of course, uh, that we were showing in this video are already happening. Um, I mean, of course, there's now route planners, etc. cetera. Uh, what we think is important, especially for the young generation um, of architects or all of you guys in the room, is basically to start imagining, if, even if it's in a very naive way, as, as we have been imagining in a very naive way, uh, these new, new technologies, because they are being, of course, thought very thoroughly from a commercial point of view. Uh, and I, we believe that uh, they should also be thought through from a very civic, uh, kind of very naive uh, public uh, perspective as well. And I think we have a role as architects to play in that, to imagine these softwares as good tools uh, that enhance uh, the public space. And so this was an attempt. And we will show you one more. Um, yeah, this time in... Uh swapping Audi out with uh, another big institution called uh, MoMA, or Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, similar, let's say, group of cities, uh, mega cities, and the growing ones. Uh, and in this particular one, um, we were asked to, to think how architects can help uh, in these cities where, let's say, it's assumed that the, the large part of the population are moving to these cities are uh, poor. Uh, so, so how can architects help with the... Um kind of uh, the urban um, inequality um, in with com coming up with tactical uh, proposals. So the, the bottom up was an important idea for the, um, for the curation of the exhibition. And we were again asked to think about the future of Istanbul. But there was one thing that was being assumed uh, about Istanbul in the exhibition, which we thought maybe wasn't so, uh, so up to date anymore. The Geja Kondo or the uh, favela, uh, what, as we call it in Istanbul is Geja Kondo, um, period was between 1960s to 1980s, and most of these neighborhoods have now been replaced by what we showed in the beginning as the post Geja Kondo. They have been legalized. I mean, they have services. Yes, density is a big issue, and quality of uh, the building stock is an issue as well. But they are, uh, they all have deeds, and they are legal. Um, but what is for us? So the informality of the city is kind of healthy in some ways, uh, but the very formality, the very formal side of the city, which is now what is being produced in, in huge numbers, uh, the city of towers. Um, but of course, when you come to Sao Paulo, a city of towers, or New York, a city of towers doesn't have to be a bad thing. But the way it is understood as just kind of these dormitories that are stuck in a large landscape is very, it looks very uh, problematic um, from our perspective. So Toki is uh, the housing um, initiative of, of the state, and it has thousands, uh, yeah, hundreds of thousands of units that is building in Istanbul and across Turkey also. And uh, strange enough, this typology is also adopted uh, by the private sector, so you get a little bit of more fancied up landscape, and you can sell it for five times the money. Uh, but that's, um, that's the running typology. But, uh Maybe it's important to say that it's, it is also providing things that are not available in the, let's say, in the self-built city from the uh, 50s and onwards. It, it is uh, typically places where you have uh, safe playgrounds, uh, sports fields, swimming pools and whatnot that, let's say, the current older city cannot accommodate simply because there is not space for it. But then, it, of course, it, it's completely cut off, cut off from production. It is uh, reliant on cart access, you know, there, there is no, and all the commercial activity happens in shopping malls, so it is also kind of proposing a new economic model of, of the city. So we, and, and this economic model we could just describe as like maybe a, very simply as a kind of sort of middle class dream. Uh, I mean, we are, we are simplifying it, but it is what it is uh, potentially, and, and is, Turkey has now nine times more debt, every individual compared to eight years ago. So, I mean, there is, of course, an increase in, in the consumer um, capacity. Uh, like similarly um, for many other uh, places of the world. But is it sustainable is a, is a question. Uh, and we see that maybe it is not so sustainable when we look at the crashes in Spain, Greece and Italy, where the most vulnerable groups were actually the middle cl class uh, itself, that um, basically, because they, uh, it's a little, um, when you have reliance on a job, you don't really have several other ways of sustaining yourself, or you, if you're not rich, basically, if you lose that job, then uh, it's, potentially much easier, faster to, um, to be affected by a crisis. So um, we could imagine a lot of horrible scenarios uh, for the future of Toki, but we wanted to imagine maybe the opposite. Could we imagine uh, better uh, scenarios? And it, we called it Quito. 
Yeah. So an essentially, it essentially is a how to re, how to reimagine this landscape of towers piercing a, a bare landscape into a let's say a landscape that has beginnings of uh, yeah. informality again in a way. Yeah. Um, um, and it was done, the work was done together with a, a group from Paris, uh, AAA, and uh, they have done a lot of uh, work on the ground. They're um, more like an activist group uh, with communities to develop strategies to, um, for creating resilient communities and neighborhoods. So we, we again uh, wanted to imagine a little application. We will show you a video. Emre lives in Kayabashi, Block A, Flat 16, because it is much cheaper compared to the city center. This estate, built on an empty plot of land, is a long way away from the surprises of the big city. It is almost completely isolated from life, and to be frank, quite bored. Yet Emre was never a boring person. He was the unusual type in high school. Whenever he felt bored, he would come up with something fun, get involved in stuff no one would expect him to. Sometimes fail, sometimes do good things, but always manage to impress the people around him. There was no doubt he had a different way of looking at the world. So it was again entirely out of boredom that Emre decided to plant tomatoes in the green plots in Kayabashi. This adventure, which began with a few tomatoes, in a short while turned into a digital application which enabled the free-of-charge sharing of tomatoes within the estate. That the tomatoes tasted delicious was one thing, but soon almost the entire estate had begun to use the application. Emre had once again managed to impress the people around him. Block B, flat 47, began to read books to kids in the evenings. The lentil soup of flat 63 became famous. Within a year, the desire of the residents of these few flats to share the services free of charge turned into a collective movement with much broader participation. Following a not so expensive infrastructure modification, the Kayabasha blocks reduced their water consumption by approximately 35% and the total volume of waste produced by the estate by 40%. Estate residents took a collective risk and without getting a permit from the municipality, opened shops along the demoralizing wall that surrounded the compound. And this collective act gave new meaning to the wall surrounding the estate and formed a new zone of living. The first shop to open belonged to Block A, Flat 19, and swiftly became both popular and successful. This was a colorful warehouse sharing stuff the children had grown out of. The adjacent shop of Block C, Flat 22, which mended small home appliances, used the barter method like all the other shops and was frequented by retired men. And it was exactly at this point that everything suddenly changed. A TV channel with high ratings broadcast a report on Kayabashi Estate, its wall of shops and its residents. It was immediately after the broadcast that the municipality, as a reward, installed solar panels that supplied the energy required for the wall and declared Kayabashi a model community. Within a short period of time, the wall of shops changed the way of life in Kayabashi. 
to stroll along the shops in the evening, to examine what was new to be shared, to take and to give, and to meet friends and new people and chat with them became an attraction. This change, which began with the sharing of a tomato, was made possible because Emre was bored. We have only one request from Emre and those like him. Please, get bored. Always. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so now we have a new way not to stay bored. Uh, it was to, to work for um, Columbia University to run their space uh, studio X Istanbul, and, which is basically an off-site uh, space that uh, GSAP has decided to open along with many other ones around the world, uh, one being in Rio that just celebrated its fifth year. Um, this year. Yeah, this year. Um, and the idea, I think, in for us, we are an office that is 10 years old, um, and we have shown a lot of projects that um, are not real, right? In some ways, the application, if we devoted two years or whatever amount of time it takes to make that application reality, um, we, we could do that. Uh, but at the same time, we, we choose not to do that, and we, instead we put our energy into helping other people come up with uh, good ideas. I think now Studio X Istanbul, for me, is very precious uh, because of that, because it's a, it's a space that has a little bit of funding that can help with seed funding to uh, small projects uh, to, uh, to take them off the ground. Um, this is from our opening. Um, then we, we can, with that uh, funding, actually help artists and architects and urban planners and designers to, to produce ideas, uh, which we were now kind of, and also publications. Um, and also workshops. This is an exhibition about uh, architecture of peace. Uh, this is done together with an artist, um, uh, Mehmet Ardener and Antonio Cosantino, which he, you know, a lot of these things, this was a posted wall about uh, prisons. Uh, what, what do we know? What do we want to know about prisons? Uh, what is the penal system in Turkey? How can we interfere as, as architects into the design of um, uh, the justice system? Um, we work a lot with makers and I think, uh, in that sense, I think um, it, without being a formal education space with um, uh, we that with students, because there is actually no students at StudiX, um, but it is actually just fostering a community and a dialogue uh, locally uh, around urbanism. Here you see it with uh, grown-ups. Um, yeah, I think I would like to just kind of share images to show you the vibrancy of the space. Um, and yes, uh, there's also really good parties. Uh, and we do work with, with children um, as well to, to, f to hear and see how they l see their city. And now, I mean, if we circle back, uh, we have a city of cars and we have children who perceive their city of cars as basically long stripes and some landmarks. Um, so, I mean, I think it is, it is more crucial. I think our city has changed so much in the last 30, 40 years uh, to ensure that we have a, a sustainable 30, 40 years ahead of us, we, we really need to start thinking about our future. So Studio X is one of those places. Um, and uh, I think this is the end of our presentation. Yeah, so if you make it to <laughs> Istanbul, we would very much like you to see you there. Uh, please right. let us know when you, if you come. All right, thank you. Thank you for your patience.